appreciate it if you would take out your King James Bibles. Amen. And the reason we get excited about that is because there are churches where they do not do that. So we appreciate we are able to do that here and we encourage doing that here. And we do do that here. And we will continue to do that here as long as our pastor is here, as long as Jeffrey is here, as long as I'm here, as long as any of you are here. <laughs> Uh, if you could please turn to the book of 1 Samuel, and we'll start in chapter number 18, 1 Samuel chapter number 18. On Wednesday nights, uh, when I've been up here, we've been doing a study, well, we started a while back a study on Bible history, and then uh, when we got to a study about the first king of Israel, as well as the second and third king, um, we decided to take a little stop and part on the topic of King David. And so we're just going to do a small bit of that study here. Uh, the notes are on the back table. Um, if you were here for any of the Wednesday night studies, you might have them already. Um, and uh, so I'll just quickly go over what some of the things we've already talked about. Uh, David, uh, his name actually means beloved. He is a shepherd. He's a soldier. He's also a psalmist with musical talent. And he's also the sovereign or the king over the land. And if you go down to big heading number one, We've been talking about David's reputation and good qualities, and uh, we'll get close to finishing that this morning, um, but we will probably wrap up on another another lesson, probably on Wednesday night. We'll wrap that up and move on. But uh, what we've talked about so far, uh, sub-point number one, David was a man after God's own heart, uh, which is not a phrase used about any other person in the Bible. Um, point number two, David was described as a neighbor of Saul's um, that is better than Saul, Saul being the previous king of Israel. Uh, David was commended to Saul because he was known by reputation for several reasons. He was musically talented. He was a mighty valiant man. He was a man of war. Prudent. He was prudent in matters. He was a comely person, and the Lord was with him, most important on that list. And point number four, David was faithful in running errands for his father to the battlefield. Point number five, David was angry when his God was defied publicly. Point six, David had faith that God would help win battles for him. Point seven, David showed respect to authority, both to the king and to his father. Amen. Point number eight, David behaved himself wisely at all times and under all circumstances. Amen. And then on the back, point number nine, this is where we left off. David acted humbly when offered high honors. And so now we're going to start at uh, point ten. Now the reason we're going through all of these is because these are good qualities that David had that we want to emulate as well. And so we are we have a very strong effort very strong emphasis on the application of all of these verses to our own personal lives as well as to the church in general. So we'll start here in uh, point number 10 on the back. Uh, David did not grow bitter when others broke their promises to him. In 1 Samuel chapter number 18, we'll start in verse 14 uh, to talk about what's going on right here. So David right now is still under uh, the headship of King Saul. Uh, he is still serving under King Saul. He is not king yet. And, or David is not king yet. And so in verse 14, we have here, And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways. We talked about that in the previous study. And the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. And here's where we start to get into point number 10, uh, verse 17. And, uh, and Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter Merib, her will I give thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not mine hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. Mm -hmm. So Saul had a little bit of an ulterior motive here. Mm -hmm. He was trying to get David to uh, die in battle. And use that for Saul's own purposes, because he didn't like David. He was jealous of him. In verse 18, David said unto Saul, Who am I, that's humility, and what is my life, or my father's family in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? Very humble man here. But, verse 19, it came to pass, at the time when Mirab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given unto Andriel, the Melochathite, to wife. And if we continue reading, you will see that David never complained about this. So even though he was promised uh, Saul's daughter to wife for being valiant and fighting in battles, he did not, Saul did not come through on his promise, and nowhere for the rest of 1 Samuel, for the rest of 2 Samuel, 1 
Kings, Second Kings, we do not see anywhere that King David, or then later King David, was jealous or was angry at Saul for doing this to him. He always still behaved himself humbly. He did not get angry. And we ourselves should not seek vengeance on others who break their promises to us or who mistreat us. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse 9, that's not 2 Peter, that is 1 Peter. First Peter 3, 9, starting in verse 8. Hey. First Peter 3, 8 says, Finally, ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Okay, so what happens when someone else does not love you as a brother, or someone else who is not pitiful, or someone else who is not courteous? What do you do? Verse 9. Not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto call, that ye should inherit a blessing. So we see here, verse 8, we should be all of one mind, we should have compassion, we should love each other as brethren, we should be pitiful and be courteous to each other. But what if someone does not do those things towards you? That does not change your responsibility to still fulfill those. And, verse 9, don't render any evil for evil. Don't recompense things to others that they did to you. Uh, as it says elsewhere in the Bible, we should not, um, I just blanked on the phrase, don't, don't do bad things to others that you don't want them to yourself. And it doesn't matter if the other person is unfaithful to you, you still need to be faithful to whatever you promise to do for them, if you promised anything to do for them. And you also need to still show compassion to them, even though they were not faithful to you. And uh, if somebody, for example, promises to pay you a certain wage on the job, and you, after the first week, you realize that they didn't pay you exactly what you wanted. You, of course, are able to point that out. Uh, they say, hey, you know, you promised to pay me this and such. But don't grow bitter towards that person because bitter, bitterness will only eat away at you. It's not going to do anything to them. So there's no reason to be, remain bitter. If somebody breaks promises to you, you, of course, the Bible does say if somebody sins against you, you can confront them. But don't grow angry towards them. Don't grow bitter towards them, and don't don't get angry about it because it's not going to do any good. And the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So there's no reason to be wrathful towards another person uh, because you're just wasting your own time, and it doesn't work the righteousness of God. It does not show a good testimony, and it's not going to help yourself either because you're just going to keep growing more and more bitter. Okay, so let's go to point number eleven here. David was willing to help others, even if the others resisted. So back to 1 Samuel chapter number 18. 1 Samuel chapter number 18. And verse 10. It says here, he was, David was willing to help others, even if they resisted. So 1 Samuel chapter number 18, verse 10. David was called upon to perform music in front of Saul whenever an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. We're not going to talk about what that means, an evil spirit from the Lord, what in the world does that mean? We're, we're not going to talk about that right now. But at some point, Saul became uh, affected by this evil spirit, and David was called to play music before him. You can call him what we call today a music therapist. Um, and um, so we have here in verse 10, he's performing that duty. Verse 10, And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. That seems like an odd thing. So an evil spirit comes upon him, and he prophesied, and he preaches. That seems strange. We're not going to run down that road today, but keep, that's still just an interesting thought to think about. David played with his hand. <laughs> there are a lot of false preachers today that have an evil spirit upon them. Let's, let's just say that. Um, there are a lot of people in pulpits who should not be in pulpits. Right. And it talks about in, I believe it's Jeremiah chapter number 23, when there's a bunch of prophets that say, you know, I'm prophesying you in the name of the Lord. And, and, G and the Lord says, I didn't send you. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I, you said, you know, thus and such is the will of God for me to tell you. And God says, no, it's not. What in the world are you talking about? And God says, I didn't send those preachers. I didn't send those prophets. I sent my prophets early to rise to you to tell you the word of the Lord, telling you to repent. Yep. Those preachers are telling you, you're a good person, you don't need to worry about anything, and God's not going to judge you. But uh, true 
prophet will tell you that what your sin is, as it says in the book of Isaiah, show my people their sin. Yeah. And he'll, he'll say, this is what your sin is, and you will then say, here's how you need to repent of your sin and turn to me and get right with me. And so uh, it is possible for preachers to have an evil spirit. Mm, good. Um, That's good. So let's see, back to verse 10. David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's, Saul's hand. Mm. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Mm -hmm. But what we can take away from that, among several other things, I mean, we could, we could touch several topics here, including um, the false prophets issue. But uh, one of the things I want to focus on here, because again, we're focusing on character qualities of David, is he was trying to help Saul. He was trying to play music uh, that was soothing, and uh, I would assume, I think it's safe to assume that that would not have been rap music or rock, rock music or uh, okay. one of the newer brands, Dubstep, which if you've never heard of that, it's like walking into a machine shop and just recording all the sound you hear. I, I don't know what in the world, why people listen to that. But anyway, uh, all of those uh, kinds of music are not the sort of music that you would be able to play on a harp like, the, right. like David was playing. So things that are played on string instruments such as a harp, uh, you're not going to get all sorts of this strange and raucous music you have today, you're going to get very soothing music and very God-honoring music, especially considering the source, David. And so we know that he was playing good music and spiritual music, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. And as he did that, uh, the Lord worked through that and was able to calm Saul down at times. But this particular time, it did not work to calm Saul down. And which is why we do not use music as a sole way to win people or as the only way to convert people because music in and of itself is not regenerative. It is not, uh, it is not going to save a person. Right. It is why we generally do not use it during outreaches. We may sing a hymn or two while we're out on an outreach, yep. um, but that is not going to be our prime method of reaching people. We do still need to preach the word. We yeah. instant in season, out of season, reproving, yeah. rebuking, and exhorting with all long suffering and doctrine. Nowhere in those verses is music mentioned. Right. Right. You can read every single evangelistic account in the book of Acts, and you will not see music employed anywhere in there. And so uh, music in and of itself will not cure a person of a, we could say, a mental disease in this case, or a spiritual disease. Yeah. And it will not cure someone of that. It may help or soothe the problem for a while, but it is not the cure. Mm -hmm. And so when... David was attempting to apply this band-aid cure, we could say, for this problem. Uh, Saul was still resisting him. And so we take away from that that David, in his humility and in his service, his attitude of service, he was still willing to help people even when they resisted his help. And so there are a lot of times when you might want to help a person and they might resist your help, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't help them. Uh, there are a lot of times when you might, uh, for example, uh, there's this thing we call chivalry, which is uh, typically a man will behave himself towards a woman, uh, whether related to or unrelated to, in a very courteous manner, or someone will behave themselves toward an elderly person in a courteous manner, or behave themselves toward, towards children to be helpful towards children, and uh, be chivalrous towards them. And this is something that has sprung upon it in our modern society because people think that that is misogynistic or you're being disrespectful. I can open the door for myself. And, and okay, well, I'll just let the door slam on you then. But don't do that. Um, uh, so it's a very good thing to help others even if they resist the help because they might, they rem might remember one day that you were helping them even when they didn't want it. And uh, people on the job, you know, you might offer to help them every now and then, and they say, no, thank you, I don't want your help, I don't like your help. But one day, they might get themselves in a pickle, and you're the only one on the, on the job that they actually care to turn to, because you're the only person who's ever been respectful towards them. Yeah. Everyone else calls them nasty names, everyone else curses at them, everyone else is disrespectful toward them. And they say, you know that one Christian over there, he's yeah. always been friendly, he's always had this Jesus stuff about him, and he's never really seemed like a problem. And he always seems happy, even you know when there's troublous times in his life. Maybe I should talk to that person. Maybe they will give me help this one time. That's, good. That's right. That's right. And hopefully you're there to do that. Yep. There was a pastor one time who was uh, witnessing to a person who 
a person in his church had witnessed to him several times over the course of, uh, I think, almost a decade. And this, this man said, no, I don't want to come to church. I don't like this Jesus stuff. And this, the other man, uh, the other Christian man kept witnessing to him. Um, but after a while, I think he moved to a different job or something. And so that lost man and the saved man didn't really talk to each other much. But the preacher ran across that lost man again. And the lost man was going through some troubling times. And the pastor said, you know, uh, I, you know I'd love to work with you and tell you about what the Bible says about that. And uh, feel free to come to church. And the lost man said, you know something? I, will, I think I will come to your church. If that man who, that I worked with, you know, five years ago or whatever, comes and invites me and takes me out. Wow. Guess what? Mm-hmm. That man had quit church about four years ago and was living in the world. And the pastor said, well, you have to be honest with him. He said, you know, that man, you know, is out in the world. And, and the lost man said, I won't come to church if he doesn't take me. So that's a pretty powerful statement saying that uh, being faithful to the Lord and being faithful to help others... Being faithful to church, being faithful to obedience to God's word, is an example that will be remembered and could affect somebody's spiritual life in the future. Right. And so I would take that very seriously. Yeah. And to walk in the way that the Lord gives us, when he says, this is the way, walk ye in it, it's not because he just wants our lives to be horrible and difficult and uneasy and hard and unpleasant. It's because this is actually the good way to walk. Yeah. Um, this is the right way, this is the old path, the good way that we should walk in. And uh, we ought to walk in that way and be faithful to doing so. Amen. And so, even if others resist, that's so that's King David, uh, then, not King David, but David, was willing to help others even when they resisted. Point number 12 in the outline, David exhibited excellent leadership skills. So in 1 Samuel, turn forward to chapter 22. This study is mostly chronological, so you'll notice as we go through the study, we go later and later in 1st and 2nd Samuel. Um, so we're going to we're fast forwarding a little bit here. We're going to where not yet King David, but he is he has uh, taken a band of men. He is fleeing from Saul for his life because Saul is coming after him for his life. Um, he is acquiring a group of we sometimes call his band of misfits. You may or may not have heard that phrase before. Uh, David's band of misfits. And uh, he is on the run from Saul. And in 1 Samuel chapter number 22, verse number, uh, let's see, where do we want to start here? Let's, let's start in verse 18. Okay, so we have some priests here that were compassion, had compassion on David when he was fleeing. They didn't know he was fleeing from the king. They didn't know that David was fleeing from King Saul. All they knew was that David needed some help as he was traveling. And But the king got wind that David had gotten help from the priests. And King Saul said, I don't like that, so I think I'm going to kill the priests. Verse 18. The king said to Doeg, turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priests, and slew on that day fourscore and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. So, at the commandment of King Saul, this man Doeg slew 85 priests, 85 uh, Levites, I believe, uh, serving the Lord, even though they were, as far as they knew, they were helping David because David was high up in the kingdom and he just needed some help. And they were faithful to David. They knew he was a faithful man. And they were faithful to doing their job. But King Saul said, I, he didn't tell you that he was running for me. Well, I think I'm going to just kill you here. So, so he did. Verse 19. And Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the edge of the sword. So now, after these 85 people, he's, he's going to kill more. Smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. So he didn't just stop with all the people in the city. He just went all out and killed all the animals as well. 20. And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. So one of these uh, men in the priestly line uh, escaped. And verse 21. And Abiathar showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priests. And David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul. 
I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. So we see here that David is taking full credit for what happened to these Levites. Was it really his fault? You could argue about that. But nonetheless, as a good leader, he took the blame for what had happened to these men. Yeah. And verse 20, and well, let, let's get to verse 23 in just a minute. Um, a good leader will take responsibility for the bad things that happen to the people that they lead. And that is, that is a good attribute of a leader. In, in fact, if somebody refuses to take ownership for some of the bad things that happen in their nation or in their state or in their city, uh, that even if they did not directly cause those things, if they do not take responsibility for that, that is a character flaw to keep in mind when you're looking at that person and saying, should I elect that person? Right. Should I want that person to be king, be president, be governor, be mayor, or whatever? Because if they lack that character quality, character qualities are usually a good indicator of how that person will govern. Because yeah. we see when wicked people get elected, they do wicked things. That's, right. That's generally how it works. Yep. Sometimes they will do things that you might agree with to an extent, but they will still lean towards wickedness. That's right. And so if you elect someone who's wicked, you're going to get someone who will generally do wicked things. And we see that all throughout the Bible. This is a, this is a rule that there really are no exceptions to. The, they might do some good things, and we do see things like that in the Bible. Yeah. But overall, they will remain a wicked person and will do wicked things. And uh, there was a recent man uh, who was president in some indeterminate time in the past uh, who... After, during this recent election cycle, I will not tell you what side of the aisle he was on, but he said, you know, if candidates on my, on my side of the aisle win, uh, then I think I should get credit for that. And if they don't win, then I shouldn't get blamed for that. Well, guess what? That's not really a very good attitude for a leader to have. And so that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at who you are choosing for your leaders if you live in a country like ours where you're able to choose a leader. Uh, or if you are going to be a leader yourself, then you need to keep that in mind uh, because if you are not going to take credit for the problems of your constituents, then your constituents probably are not going to like you very much if you look at it from a, just a practical perspective like that. And if you look from it from a biblical perspective, then you're disobeying the word of God. And so we ought not to do things like that. And also, sub-point B here, David sought to protect his God-given constituents. So here, now, now let's look at verse 22 and 23. And David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day, when Doeg the Edomite was there, that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. Abide thou with me, fear not, for he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life, but with me thou shalt be in safeguard. Leaders, politicians, elected officials, uh, dictators, whatever, they need to seek to protect their God-given constituents, as David did here. David was not a king at this point, but he was leading a group of people, and he was protecting them in the wilderness. It's interesting that this quality we see here, that he is seeking to protect his constituents, he did not say, you will be well off with me. Notice, he did not say, he did not say you'll be wealthy. He did not say that you're going to have a comfortable place to sleep. He didn't say I'm going to give you free welfare checks. He didn't say I'm going to redistribute money for you so you don't have to work. He said, you'll be safe with me because you'll be protected from those who want to hurt you. Good. This is a essential, an essential part of government That's is protecting right. the country over which you preside. Amen. That is why we have presidents. They right. preside over their country, and one of the main fundamental duties of them over the country over which they preside is that they protect their That's constituents. Right. That's right. Um, this is why in the, in, in the nation of Israel, they had an army to protect their nation, mm -hmm. and also to carry out God's will to destroy enemy nations as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it was not the business of the government to hand out welfare checks. Right. It was not their uh, business to regulate whether or not they want to chop off parts of their body to pretend that they are a type of human that they are not. 
Uh, none of this is the business of government. It is making sure that your people are safe and protected. And we also see in the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul, as Apostle Peter, talk about, uh, we ought to pray for those in authority. We, they have to give account, and they, are, they have their authority, because I believe it's in the book of Romans. I might be switching up what I'm thinking about here. But they need to be able to protect you. They're given for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those that do well. And they are given to protect the people in their nation. And, excuse me, and we know that King David was not going to be giving out free welfare checks there. His people that he was with were not going to be well off, so to speak. He was living in caves and mountains, dens and caves of the earth, the book of Hebrews says, because they were fleeing from King Saul. But D David still promised that if you're with me, you will be safe. We might be dwelling in caves and mountains, but you'll be yep. safe. You yeah. might not have a ton yeah. to eat every single day, right. but you'll right. be safe. Good. You might not enjoy every single moment you're out here with me, right. but you will be safe. Amen. In fact, we see one time when he uh, was fighting a battle, and he came back to the town that he was residing in at that time, called Ziklag, and it had been looted by an end by enemies, and they, the enemies had taken all of the wives out of that city, and everyone in the city said, you know, David, why'd you let this happen? And he said, he basically said, don't worry, we're going to get everything back, we're going to go attack them, and it says there, there was not a single person lost. Yeah. That enemy that took away all their wives, they recovered all their wives, they recovered all their possessions, they recovered everything, and David said, what did I tell you? <laughs> um, and so, it's a good quality for a leader to be able to protect those you have given, uh, you have been given Precedence. You have been given, sorry, you've been given authority over, uh, whether you're a king, a president, a governor, a mayor, a father, a wife, a whatever. Um, you've been given authority in some way, and unless you are two months old, you probably have authority over something or someone. And so God trusts you with that authority, and so please be like David and use that authority wisely. And I think that's all we have time for today, so we'll stop there. And uh, we'll pick up with this, hopefully finish it, probably on a Wednesday night or something. And that's it. I hope that was a blessing. I hope that was helpful. And I guess we'll move on to whoever's. Right, okay. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you again for an opportunity to gather together in your house, to be able to study this man named David, a man after your own heart, someone who can be a good example for the rest of us. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you would take these issues to heart and apply them to our lives and be able to live right according to your word. Mm -hmm. We now pray for the upcoming service here at church in Bible Baptist Temple this morning. You'd be with the song service and that we would be able to sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs that praise and honor you. And uh, because we love to praise and honor you, Lord, you're, you're the only one who's worthy to receive glory yeah. and honor and power. Yeah. Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Yeah. So we pray for the song service, we pray for the preaching this morning, we pray that your word would go forth and would convict people, encourage people, and uh, maybe see someone turn to the Lord for salvation, or turn to the Lord for further service, or turn to the Lord of, of sins in their life, Lord. Uh, Lord, every, even Christians have sins in their life that need to be repented of. And so we pray that you would work in people's hearts this morning, and we pray as we also go our separate ways this afternoon, and bless the evening service as well. And we thank you again for the opportunity, and in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you.